You want to hurt me? Go right ahead if it makes you feel any better. I'm an easy target. Yeah, you're right. I talk too much. I also listen too much. I could be a cold-hearted cynic like you. But I don't like to hurt people's feelings. Well, you think what you want about me. I'm not changing. I like, I like me. My wife likes me. My customers like me. Because I'm the real article. What you see is what you get. On March 3rd, 1994, John Candy, the larger-than-life comedian best known for his hilarious performances in Uncle Buck, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, and Spaceballs, called some friends and family after a day of filming his most recent project, Wagons East. Candy was one of the greats of the previous generation of comedy giants, including John Belushi, Dan Aykroyd, Steve Martin, and Bill Murray, but comedy was starting to change. A younger generation was on the rise with their own brand of antic, edgy energy led by guys like Adam Sandler, Chris Farley, and Jim Carrey, and they were starting to make the past generation of stars look a bit, well, old. The survivors from this generation were beginning to pivot to more serious and sophisticated fare to stay relevant. Bill Murray was no longer doing camp comedies like meatballs and slapstick golf farces like Caddyshack, and he was opting for more high-concept projects like wrestling with existential dread in a time loop in 1993's Groundhog Day or black-and-white biopics like Ed Wood. But Candy was sticking with what had worked so wonderfully for him over his career, broad comedies that allowed his comedic gifts and natural empathy to radiate through the screen. Wagons East fit perfectly in the mold as a Western adventure comedy pairing Candy with a neurotic ex-doctor played by Richard Lewis and a gay bookseller played by John C. McGinley. It wasn't exactly breaking new ground, but Candy's legacy was already secure by this point, having starred or co-starred in some of the most iconic movies of the 1980s. And the actor appeared to be enjoying the twilight of his career. The calls with his children that night don't stand out in any particular way. It was just Candy telling his kids that he loved them before saying goodnight. His daughter, Jen, who was just 14 at the time, recalled that her father had just been home for her birthday in February. Typical of teenagers, she remembers feeling slightly distant on the call that night because she was studying for a vocabulary test the next day. Nothing was amiss, so she didn't pay it much mind. Nobody thinks a casual call with their father, even when their father is a lifetime smoker who tips the scales at nearly 300 pounds, could end up being the last. And although there was a family history of health problems, John's father had passed away from complications due to heart disease at just 35 in 1955 when John was just five years old, and John's brother had previously survived a heart attack, Candy always seemed to be brimming with vitality and good cheer on screen. The specter of heart disease was an unfortunate and inescapable fact that would haunt the actor throughout his life, but he never seemed to let fear of it deter him from pursuing his passions. The next day of shooting was one of the last for the movie, which reportedly came as a relief for Candy. The film was being shot in Durango, Mexico, a city about 100 miles northwest of Mexico City, and being away from home was tough on the actor. By all accounts, it was not the easiest shoot for the actor. The material was middling at best, and filming on location in Mexico can be an isolating experience, particularly when you don't speak the language. And on top of that, Candy believed he'd just delivered one of the best performances of his career and was in a celebratory mood. So with the film wrapping up on principal photography around 10 p.m. that evening, and Candy pleased with what he delivered, he decided to cook a huge late-night meal for some members of the cast and crew, whipping up a huge spaghetti dinner for everyone involved and soaking in the accomplishment before heading home. One of his co-stars, Robert Picardo, said Candy was like a little kid who had a great day at camp. He wanted to thank us. After dinner, Candy went to take a shower and go to bed. He would never wake up. John Candy was 43 years old. I'm Derek Kaufman. I'm Jason Beckerman. And this is Last Days, John Candy. Candy was discovered unresponsive in his bedroom the next morning, and paramedics were called. Hector Partida, a spokesman for Durango, said Candy apparently suffered a massive heart attack and was already dead by the time first responders arrived on scene. Production of the movie was immediately suspended, although much of the principal photography was already in the can, and the remainder of the film was able to be finished with body doubles and editing techniques in post-production. His official death certificate is written in Spanish and ascribes the actor's death to infarto agudo myocardio, which translates to acute myocardial infarction, which is the technical term for a heart attack. There are a few other details in the report aside from descriptions of his height and general appearance, 
The heart attack apparently struck at some point while he slept, and by the time he was discovered, it was simply too late to save him. Although a heavy smoker throughout his life since around the age of 17, it's not immediately clear whether or not and to what extent this contributed to the heart attack. There is, of course, well-documented connection in scientific literature between smoking and being the leading cause of cardiovascular disease. Chemicals in cigarettes are known to inflame cells that lie in blood vessels and lead to hardening of the arteries. Yeah, I wanted to point out that this autopsy report, Jason, is very sparse. We look at these all the time, obviously, in doing research for this podcast. And when you die in the United States, there's often a report. It's several pages long. There's a big narrative history and a full description of the body. This, because it happened in Durango, Mexico, it is uh, not as much infrastructure. And the report is just very short. It says he died of, uh, of the heart infarction. And there's little other detail other than basic details of his height and weight. And frankly, I, I'm not sure how much you would have been able to glean from a uh, death or a, a coroner's report, regardless of the the location it was done. There's not much here, right? This is a, a profoundly overweight man, as we'll talk about, a longtime smoker uh, who died of a heart attack in his sleep. I think this is, you know, I, I don't want to be too callous about it, but this is the natural end to a life well lived uh, of a man of a certain stature and with certain habits that weren't necessarily the healthiest. I think that's right. Candy also had a history of drug and alcohol use dating back to his raucous days as a performer with the famed Second City comedy troupe in Toronto that included Bill Murray and Gilda Radner, along with a host of others. He was famously a man of prodigious appetites, so there were these legendary stories about John Candy imbibing massive amounts at parties back in the day. He used to say that his time with the troupe, he said, I learned how to drink, stay up real late, and spell drugs. Hardly healthy habits, but certainly par for the course in the 70s. Now, Candy also suffered from bouts of anxiety and depression, and he often turned to food, drugs, and alcohol as a means of self-medicating to address these issues. After John Belushi died in 1982, and we covered that in a previous episode, Candy resolved to get things under control, and by most accounts, he kicked most dangerous habits he had, the hard drugs and the alcohol. The sad reality, however, is that the toll of drug use leaves behind lasting scars that when combined with his weight issues and family history of heart disease could have contributed to him being sort of a ticking time bomb for this ultimate outcome. Given the many risk factors past drug use and alcohol use, obesity, the family history of cardiovascular disease, friends and family would later say that John lived with an ever-present sense of dread about falling victim to a heart attack. Carl Reiner, who directed John Candy in Summer Rental in 1985 and is a legend in his own right, said the actor often seemed at times resigned to his eventual fate. He said, quote, he felt he had inherited in his genes a Damoclean sword, so it didn't matter what he did. Candy's brother-in-law added, it was always in the back of everyone's mind. No one talked about it, but it was in the back of John's mind, too. Yeah, it wasn't like this sense of fatalism translated into a complete descent into excess and gluttony. He once lost 100 pounds over a summer while preparing for a film role, but he was never able to keep the weight off very long. Candy often complained to interviewers about his struggles with diets, but also knew that his girth was a key part of his appeal on film. His sheer size, he was a towering six foot three and close to 300 pounds, juxtaposed with his cuddly warmth with a potent combination and helped him convey sweetness and empathy alongside his humor. There's a really famous scene from 1991's Only the Lonely, where Candy plays a shy Chicago cop, falls in love with a funeral home worker played by Ali Sheedy. Here he is asking her out on a date by bumbling through a list of reasons she could give to avoid the date. It's vintage Candy, disarmingly sweet, but with impeccable comedic timing. Here we go. Reasons why you can't go out with me on Saturday. You're seeing somebody else. No. You're having your wisdom teeth pulled. No. You're washing your hair. You're going shopping. No. You have to babysit for your uh, neighbor's kids, nieces, or nephews. No. You're doing the laundry. No. You have to lube your car. No. You're getting your legs waxed. <laughs> no. I think that just about covers everything. I love that scene because he's a he's yeah. a plausible romantic lead. He's this big heavy yeah. security guard, and he's just. Slowly breaking down Ali Sheedy. But to, to the point you're making about how he used, he, his weight was part of his on-screen persona. And you see it in every single movie that I can remember that he did, starting out with Stripes. That's my first recollection of John Candy very early on, early 80s. 
And he was the big, the big chubby guy that everybody made fun of. And he leaned into that. There's a huge like mud wrestling scene where it's all about his weight. And that goes through obviously planes, trains, and automobiles, on and on and on. Every movie, the role that he had that I can remember was based upon his weight. Yeah, we talked about this in the Chris Farley episode as well. When you are known as the fat, funny guy, yeah. there's a tendency to want to remain that. We've seen uh, you know, modern day actors struggle with that. Jonah Hill used to be the fat, funny guy in, yeah. in Judd Apatow movies, and then he said, you know what, I'm going to lose weight. It's healthier for me to go through life, even if people say I was funnier back then. Yeah. This is the way I want to proceed with my life. And Candy and Farley sort of struggled with that the, a bit There's more. obviously more of an, I don't know, acceptance of people being who they are now, right? But Jonah Hill realizing that it was for his health loss all the weight. He's still very successful and does lots of roles. I think that Candy, once he established himself in this in this sort of way, didn't really have much of a career choice but to stay heavy. Yeah. I, I think it would have harmed his career. And I don't think at the time there would have been much apology about, well, he's no longer fat, so we no longer want to cast him as much. I think that was just the, sort of the way Hollywood worked at the time. I think right? that's right. He was probably very anxious about what would I be, and it probably was well-founded anxiety right. about how he would... Uh, proceed in Hollywood without the weight. As news of his death circulated, tributes for the legendary actor really flooded in. Candy's children, first and foremost, Jennifer, who was 14 at the time of her father's death, and Christopher, who was just 11, recalled feeling overwhelmed by the outpouring of love, noting how LAPD stopped traffic to escort them to the funeral at St. Martin of Tours Catholic Church in Los Angeles before their father was finally laid to rest at Holy Cross Cemetery in Culver City. Chris said, Whenever I feel like I lose the importance of him to people, I just remember that happened. They do that for the president. Candy was also legendarily charitable, selflessly contributing to Make-A-Wish Foundation and the Pediatric AIDS Foundation, something his co-stars could attest to. Here's Tom Hanks recalling one such instance. You know, he's involved in these kids. You know, these kids are essentially suffering from cancer, in most cases terminal cancer. These kids, meaning these kids don't have long to live. He had been approached, I guess, somehow to become involved with them. And there was a big group of them, and the wish these kids had was to meet John and myself, the two guys from Splash. And because it was came, came from John, I said, I'll be there. Tell me when. The Ninja Turtles are there, and the, you know, there's, there's, there's pizza, and there's cake, blah, 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 and these kids. And John footed the bill. He did it all. It was an easy thing for him to do. It was never something that that uh, uh, could any way at all be construed as being some sort of, of self-serving moment. I wanted to pause on this for a moment because there are two approaches to charity. There's sort of what I like to call the Paul Newman approach, which is he was very associated with his own charitable endeavors and it became a large part of his persona publicly to be involved with that. And then there's the very quiet side of just doing it behind the scenes. I'm not here to uh, value judge either, but I find it interesting that we learn most of that John, most about John Candy's charitable endeavors after yeah, he in passed. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and Harvey talks about this a lot, it being being sort of quiet and not self serving about about these missions. And from my vantage point, there are reasons to do it both ways. But it's interesting to note when someone is so quiet about it, it means it's sort of their heart is really in the right place. Right. One of the coolest tributes, and I wanted to mention this um, to John Candy, came from the experimental rock band Ween, which dedicated its 1994 album Chocolate and Cheese to the memory of John Candy. The lead singer, Gene Ween, said there was so much going on about Kurt Cobain. Remember, this is 1994. And nobody mentioned John Candy at all. I have a special little spot in my heart for him. There's also been a semi-serious campaign to get the Canadian Screen Awards to be called The Candies, kind of like the Emmys in honor of the late actor and because it sounds sort of like uh, Canada, the word. As humble as he was, I think John Candy might have gotten a kick out of that as well. So Steve Martin, who famously uh, starred in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles with John Candy, struggled to deal with his death, saying, quote, he was a very sweet guy, very sweet and complicated. He was always friendly, always outgoing, funny, nice, and polite. But I could tell he had kind of a little broken heart inside him. He was a brilliant actor, especially in Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. I think it was his best work. Let's go ahead and take a break, and we'll come back and talk about John Candy's legacy. So we, we heard a little bit before the break about Steve Martin's uh, really deep feelings for John Candy. And in, in the quote that we read, he was alluding to the qualities that made Candy such a reliably funny and heartwarming presence just about every time he was on the screen. You know, part of that charm comes from his background. He wasn't a theater nerd, but instead was a pretty good athlete, starring as an offensive tackle at his Catholic high school in Ontario, Canada. 
He only switched to pursuing acting full-time after suffering a knee injury, honing his natural comedic gifts with Toronto's branch of the Second City troupe in 1972 and becoming part of the cast of SCTV when it was picked up in 1981, became a genuine rival of Saturday Night Live, even winning two Emmy Awards for writing. Candy was one of the breakout stars, along with Rip Moranis, Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, and Martin Short. He had a slew of recurring characters like street reporter Johnny LaRue, Heard here teaching a young kid to smoke cigarettes. Yeah, see this is a lighter? See that? Now I light it. Mmm. And that end gets hot, and that's combustion. Then you suck it in your lungs. You know where your lungs are? You do? Yeah. I know where one of mine is. It's in a hospital in a jar. From there, he bounced around the acting scene a bit, providing memorable sparks in some pretty forgettable movies like Steven Spielberg's failed comedy 1941 and the action thriller Double Negative. But his big break came playing the lovable army recruit Dewey Oxberger alongside Bill Murray and Harold Ramis in Ivan Reitman's smash 1981 hit Stripes. My name's Dewey Oxberger. My friends call me Ox. You might have noticed I've... uh got a slight weight problem. No. Yeah, I do. No. Yeah, yeah, I do. Anyway, I went to this doctor and well, he told me I, I swallowed a lot of aggression along with a lot of pizzas. <laughs> pizzas. <laughs> He's so good. I know this is one of your favorite movies, Jason, so I had to have a Stripes clip in there. After Stripes, Candy put together one of the best comedic runs in history. He appeared in small roles in Harold Ramis's National Lampoon's Vacation, nabbed a cameo in Little Shop of Horrors, showed up alongside rising star Tom Hanks in Splash, and played the best friend of comedy legend Richard Pryor in Brewster's Millions, even taking the lead role in Carl Reiner's Summer Rental. He really could do no wrong during this period. He was just in back-to-back classic 80s comedies. And that's not even mentioning Candy's hilarious turns in my two favorite movies of 1987, John Hughes' Plane Trains and Automobiles, which we heard at the top, and Mel Brooks' Spaceballs. Now, I already played you a little bit of Planes, Trains, and it was more fitting for the episode to do the poignant scene, but I would be remiss if I didn't give you a little clip from Spaceballs. Uh, Hi. Who are you? Barf. Not in here, mister. This is a Mercedes. Nah, that's my name. Barf. Barf? What are you? I'm a mog. Half man, half dog. I'm my own best friend. It was Candy's collaborations with iconic 80s director John Hughes that would leave his most lasting mark on Hollywood. During his career, Candy would star or appear in seven Hughes projects, uh, National Lampoon's Vacations, Planes, Strange, and Automobiles, The Great Outdoors, Uncle Buck, Career Opportunities, She's Having a Baby, and Home Alone. Hughes was devastated by Candy's sudden death. Vince Vaughn, who was friends with Hughes, would say, quote, He talked a lot about how much he loved Candy. If Candy had lived longer, I think John would have made more films as a director. You know, we we talked. We were talking before we went on the air about you can judge somebody's age by what they most, how they most fondly remember John Candy, yes. right? For me, it's Stripes, early '80s. I, I thought his role there was fantastic. It's still my favorite part of the role. But you're a plane, trains, and automobiles and guy, a spaceballs guy. In 1987, I was a seven year old. How do you not love him in a dog costume, right? In in outer space, sending up Star Wars. It was incredible. And you're right. He's that to both of us yeah. because his career was so long that you're slightly older than me, but we both have classic but candy But then in our the brain. people we work with who are younger than us all were saying he's from Home Alone. He's the guy from Home Alone. Other people might say he's the guy from Cool va- Runnings. Vacation, Cool Runnings. There's diff- he had his career was a couple decades long and everybody picked up on John Candy at different points in the, at sort of the same point in their life I should say. You sort of really learn to love him when you're between like I think 8 and 12 years old. That's when you learn to love Candy. It depends how, when that came along in your life. I think that's exactly right and it's a, it's a perfect segue to the counterfactual with John Candy because he meant so much to people of different generations. What would have become? He died in his 40s. So right. he still had a lot of life to live if he And he was still active. He died on a film set as well. So what would have happened if he hadn't passed? For John himself, there are a few clues. It was clear that his interests were starting to shift to being behind the camera as he just made a directorial debut in the 1994 TV comedy Hostage for a Day. To direct, uh, to, uh, it's, it's, uh, you have to have a good understanding, you have to be a good storyteller, you have to be very comfortable within yourself. And I mean, I think I'm reaching that point, uh, that I felt, yes, I can do this, and without any trepidation, that I'm not going to be having panic attacks and freaking out. And um, you know, I feel very comfortable with who I am, and that's what you see is what you get. Now, 
I want to be completely honest about the end of John Candy's career. The last three projects on his IMDb are Wagons East, Hostage for a Day, and Canadian Bacon. They're hardly comedy classics, but there's glimmers of his genius in in each of them. I have seen all three of them, and you can still see classic Candy. I selfishly wish he uh, wouldn't have gone behind the camera if he had lived. He's such a presence on screen. It's that empathy that he's able to radiate that even if he's a complicated sort of individual like Steve Martin, one of his collaborators said he had the chops, I think, to maybe go behind the camera. What a loss if you had lost his screen presence. He also started to do some more serious roles about this time. You know, he had taken on the role in JFK uh, famously. Yes. And, uh, you know, he may have trended in that direction. I could see that happening. You see a lot of comedic actors sort of turn to more serious stuff. You can only do comedy maybe for so long and, you know, turn more serious and inward and introspective in his later career, I think likely is the place that he would have gone. I think that's right. A lot of people like to think of John Candy in the same sense as Chris Farley because they were both funny men who died too right. young, but they were very, very different characters. And he did have this serious side. Like you said, he was in JFK. It's hard to imagine Chris Farley having that gear because right. we never saw it. Even yeah. at the end of his life, he was preparing to be in Shrek. You know, he was doing voice work for a, a comedic animated film. But Candy, we saw some of the work because he lived a bit longer. And he was clearly the creative inspiration for John Hughes. I mean, if people think of Molly Ringwald as John Hughes muse, it's really John Candy yeah. was in the most John Hughes movies. And he was one of the voices of the 80s and 90s. And Vince Vaughn mentioned how we would have seen maybe more John Hughes movies if John Candy hadn't died. He was also pegged uh, for a Hughes collaboration at the time of his death. It was a comedy about feuding neighbors set to star Sylvester Stallone and John Candy. And it was called Bartholomew versus Neff. But it obviously never happened, which you might imagine, bums me out to no end. Yeah. John Candy and Sylvester Stallone are two of my favorite actors on earth, and we never got to see that. It's also worth remembering that at the time of his death, Candy was just a year removed from his role as the cranky but lovable old bobsled coach in Cool Runnings, which elevated a fairly flimsy family movie into an instant classic. He was also in talks to portray Ignatius J. Riley in the adaptation of one of my favorite books, John Kennedy Tools, A Confederacy of Dunces and expressed some interest in developing a biopic based on silent film star Fatty Arbuckle. Kind of interesting that Chris Farley had taken on the mantle of somebody who was thinking about that role when, when he died as well. Sam Kinison as well. The Sa Fatty Arbuckle is right? project is considered one of the cursed projects of Hollywood because everyone who has been in discussions passes away. Got it. He was also supposed to star in a remake of 1950 classic Last Holiday, but it never happened and was turned into a pretty pedestrian remake with Queen Latifah in 2006. So people didn't really have a very complicated relationship with John Candy. He was probably as close as one can get to being universally beloved. This was nothing like the death of John Belushi, who we've covered, who was widely respected as a comedic genius, but also had a reputation for being self-destructive, volatile, and even sometimes cruel. This also wasn't like the tragic death of the insecure and drug-abusing Chris Farley, whose friends watched helplessly as he fell into the throes of addiction. And it's not even like the suicide of Robin Williams, who battled many demons psychologically before taking his own life after being diagnosed with a rare form of dementia. John Candy touched so many people's lives, and the Internet is just riddled with people telling personal stories about working with him. His genuine kindness and generosity are pretty rare qualities for stars of his stature, but nearly everyone looks back fondly on their time with him. But Catherine O'Hara sticks out the most to me. She not only starred alongside Candy in Home Alone, but was one of his dear friends from the old Second City days, and so I thought it only fitting to give her the final word from her touching eulogy at Candy's funeral that really captured the essence of what made him such a special person. I think of John in terms of the big picture. John's life had meaning. John had principles. He lived by them. He worked by them. He set a good example in so many ways. He was a protector. He cared. If he felt you'd been wronged in any way, he'd risk everything to make it right, to make you know you were worth something, too. In a business that indulges the weaker souls, where the insecure lends other words far too much meaning, John was a humble, sensitive man, full of faith, who seemed forever grateful for his gift and his time on this earth. 